So by now, everybody knows about the Pixar theory. It posits that every Pixar series is secretly connected into one greater narrative, and that all of the easter eggs to other films are intentionally placed there to build up to it. I believe there is another company that has done the exact same thing, and unlike the Pixar theory, this has had direct interaction between the various characters in their shows. This is the Glitch Productions Matrix theory. Yeah, I know this is a bit different from my usual forte, but I wanted to try something new, and hey, I think I found something here. Also, spoilers for anyone who hasn't seen any of these shows. Glitch Productions started as a company made by Kevin and Lou Lurt... 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 I... Lurt... I can't pronounce that. ...to help run their long-time cinema series, SMG4. With its success, alongside the Australian government, they funded and created their very first animated series, Meta Runner, followed by a direct spin-off to SMG4 known as Sunset Paradise. Since then, they've used their success to help fund other creator shows, such as Liam Victor's Murder Drones, Gooseworks' The Amazing Digital Circus, and the currently in production Gaslight District by Part-Time Seagull. My theory posits that all of these shows actually take place in the same connected universe. And that's f***ing stupid. Ignoring Sunset Paradise since that was a direct spin-off to SMG4, Meta Runner's main protagonist, Tari, is a character in SMG4, and they're both clearly different people in different worlds. Hell, Tari dies at the end of Meta Runner, and they're both portrayed by two different actresses. Likewise, Murder Drones, Digital Circus, and the Gaslight District are all made by completely different creators who've already done their own things in the past. There's no reason to suggest that their shows should tie into each other in any other way. Right? There's an episode of SMG4 called The Very Safe and Legal SMG4 Show. The plot of the episode revolves around the gang trying to raise money for a new place to stay, and what happens next changes everything we know about these series. But wait, where's my assistant? Oh no, not again! Whoops, long show. How is Pomni in SMG4? This is never mentioned or explained before or afterwards. If Pomni is supposed to be trapped in a game, how is she here? And remember, the Tari from SMG4 and the Tari from Meta Runner are supposed to be completely different people. How does this make any lick of sense? Well, I think I already have an answer. It's a one-off joke. This doesn't have any real meaning to it, and it was probably just a reference to the fact that the show is in production. Well, think again. Listen to what Pomni says as she's panicking. Oh no, not again! Oh no, not again. Think back to the very first time the Digital Circus was announced, for the original teaser on Gooseworks' channel. Kane summons Pomni after she's trying to eat something. And as FG4, we see the exact same thing happening. Now, ladies and gentlemen! She's calling back to a canon event that happened to the actual Pomni. And if Meta Runner Brari and SMG4 Tari are supposed to be different characters, how does Pomni here know something that should have only happened in the canon digital circus? Okay, 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 let's let's slow down here for a second. We'll get back to this point in a minute, but if every glitch show is supposed to be connected, the first thing we have to address is the elephant in the room. How is Tari in both SMG4 and in Meta Runner? Both are explicitly stated on several occasions to be very different characters, so they're busted, right? They can't possibly coexist, right? We actually did get somewhat of an answer in the SMG4 episode called Into the Mario Verse, where SMG4 Tari actually met her Meta Runner counterpart. Tari? Is that you? Who? Who are you? So it seems like we had an answer all along, an alternate universe scenario. Except the fact that there is a disclaimer at the beginning saying that this isn't canon to either show. Unfortunately, Meta Runner Tari and SMG4 Tari have never officially met in either of their canons. And unfortunately, they probably never will. Huh? <laughs> Shit. In the very first episode of Meta Runner, Tari runs past the screen and sees her SMG4 counterpart. And you can't even chalk this up to being some kind of fun house mirror either, because another guy looks into it, and he sees himself as Axel. And if some part of you just thinks this is some random easter egg, think again. In War of the Fat Italians 2019, Tari is getting a headache, and she sees this. Huh? What? What the? Uh... <sighs> the exact 
exact same interaction from the other side. The Meta Runner world is obsessed with technology and, more particularly, video games. The way I see it, the only way this makes sense is that if SMG4 is a game in the world of Meta Runner. We know that the characters in all of the games are sentient, just like Theo, which would explain why Atari's animated persona doesn't need her input in the SMG4 world. But is there any evidence to suggest that SMG4 is an in-universe game? Actually, there is. Before they were Glitch Productions, the company was originally called Glitchy Boy, and they had a different intro to match. And each intro showed a cartridge of either SMG4, The Awesome Mario, or Hobo Rose being plugged into a console. That's already pretty good evidence as is, but the smoking gun evidence is found in the most unlikely spot. In the OST video for Meta Runner, we see Tari chilling by herself playing some games, and take a good look at what's inside her room. A cartridge for War of the Fat Italians, and a figure of SMG4. There is no way Tori would have these items unless SMG4, and probably all of the other spin-offs, were a video game franchise in-universe. Not only would this explain why Tari is in SMG4, it would also explain every contradiction in SMG4 itself. Like we see with Axel and Tari in Meta Runner, it is exactly like Gmod, the source engine used for most of SMG4. The glitching, the dropping in and out of the series, the tonal switches, it's all a massive role-playing game by people done in a Gmod-like setting. And if you still don't believe me, there's a billboard for Glitch Productions in Silica City. Not used for any title guard, just tucked away in the opening title screen. SMG4 and all of its spin-offs are video games in the world of Meta Runner. So, that explains the two Taris, but we still have no explanation for both Murder Drones or the Digital Circus. Let's start with Murder Drones, as that series is complete. The series takes place far off into the future, even more so than Meta Runner does. Earth has already been destroyed by the Absolute Solver, robots have picked up the pieces on another planet, and they're owned by a company called JC Jensen, and there's no reference to any previous show that I found. This show has to be disconnected from the other Glitch series, right? Here's an interesting question that's always bothered me about Murder Drones. Why does a cleaning company make robots? In the pilot, Uzi says, Yeah, we were mistreated in the name of Windex. And in a non-canon video, Jay actually lists some of the in-universe products that JC Jensen makes. With such notable brands as... Windox, Chuck the Duck, Rad, Mr. Bald, Zibbity Zip Zip Baggies, and Wee Wee. These are all parodies of real-life cleaning and kitchen supply brands. Why would a typical cleaning company also be making robots? Now, maybe JC Jensen outsourced the robot, but we know for a fact that's not true either. One of Jay's defining traits is the loyalty to the company that made her. Ah, damn, the well-made, quality-assured durability of JC Jensen products! And we clearly see in the Zombie Drones training tape that they develop and even make videos for the handlings of the robots. We never get a clear answer to this. Or do we? In Meta Runner, Cascorp is also shown producing these robots known as Bot Boys. And these characters bear an uncanny resemblance to the drones. Obviously, they're not one to one, but the main details are there the white metal sheen outside, visor eyes that have different colors for the robots, and even down to the same designs in their fingers. Remember, Murder Drones takes place far off into the future, even more so than Meta Runner's technology. Is it possible the Bot Boys were the original worker drones? The Bot Boys are owned by Task Corp, which later becomes Share Corp at the end of the series. JC Jensen is a company that specializes in cleaning supplies, so it wouldn't make sense that they made robots, unless, at some point in the future, JC Jensen bought out Share Corp and incorporated their products into their brand. Back in the Zombie Drones training tape, there's a small detail about the handling of their robots. We see the things that JC Jensen makes. Drones, cleaning supplies, and strangely, an internet icon. This is never explained in the show, or so I thought. Tabscourt's biggest thing was their online profile. They had areas that you can live stream freely, sold tons of devices to help your performance, and obviously, the meta runners who would perform and compete for audiences. What if this is what the internet symbol is referencing? Their gaming stars across the cyberspace. Okay, 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 but what about the humans? 
In Murder Drones, the humans in the memory of the drones are shown as pitch black silhouettes with white eyes. Similarly, in SMG4, we see Mr. Puzzles reflect on his backstory and taking a very similar appearance. Puzzles was originally human and later converted himself into a robot. Yes, SMG4 is a game here like we're saying, but this flashback sequence takes place in the virtual minds of the drones. This might be how robots see humans in this world. Likewise, when we see humans outside of these flashbacks, we see them in detail, albeit in costume. It makes sense for some workers to be wearing their suits in areas near the outside or near the Absolute Solver, but what's strange is that we see scientists dressed like this even when deep inside factories and areas they built, where they realistically would have oxygen. However, we've seen this type of thing before. The Task Corp scientists, just like murder drones, always wear these white suits and masks with oxygen funneling. Again, it's not one-to-one, -one, but the evidence lines up. The creations and workers of Task Corp were the precursors to what we see in murder drones. Whether or not JC Jensen bought them out, or maybe it was a company merger, but regardless, this explains why a cleaning utility company specializes in robots and technology. Murder Drones is out of the way, but now back to where we all started, the amazing digital circus. The entire plot of the game revolves around the characters being trapped in a VR game, literally brought into the game's world. If SMG4 is a game like we've established, this would explain how Pomni was suddenly transported from the circus to the showgrounds. It's another game in the cyberspace, but let's hold on to that for a moment. The entire plot of Meta Runner hinged on how Taz Corp and Lux wanted to use Tari's ability to bring herself into the video games. Why would they have been the only company who wanted something like this? The real world video game industry is a constant arms race against each other, and there are many examples of companies trying to one up each other with their tech. Is it possible the Amazing Digital Circus was another company's attempt at doing this? While we obviously don't see too much of the outside world in the circus, we do end up seeing the computer at the end of the pilot, along with the headset beside it. We know these people were playing the game and got trapped in VR, but we see the headset lying beside it on the table. If they were playing the game, shouldn't they have all been lying comatose with the headset? Hell, in Meta Runner, that's exactly what happens to Tari. But also remember, the only reason Theo and Tari are even physically in the real world is because of Sheridan's server being able to host them long enough for their bodies to materialize. With it gone, they weren't stable enough and had to stay in the cyberspace. Maybe what's happening at the circus is that the botched process of transporting them into the game made them unstable in the real world, thus only able to live in the servers of the circus and losing their physical body. There's also a logo on the door in the replica office during the pilot, labeled C and A. While we aren't given any follow-up information here, Kinger does say in Episode 3, Seven years of computer science for this, huh? Considering this is a room mimicking the actual office space at the end of the pilot, this is most likely the company that made the digital circus, and Kinger probably worked there. Now, despite the circus's technology obviously being super advanced, it is worth noting the computer is in the style of one from the 90s, and there was even a trailer for it in the style of a VHS recording. Combined with the characters' aesthetics, the show probably takes place in the 1990s, right? Well, remember, J.C. Jensen uses VHS tapes for their training videos, and the world of Meta Runner is shown to use cartridges for their games, some of which even in the style of 90s consoles like the Game Boy and Super Nintendo. Either it's a retro aesthetic that the companies are trying to take advantage of, or maybe it just happens to look like old tech, but regardless, every show with futuristic technology still uses these old-fashioned elements. Every glitch show is subtly connected to each other, every reference and easter egg we see secretly hinting at one big world. Some shows are the in-universe games that can be played, for better or for worse, but others show the direct build-up to humanity's downfall. I even think the upcoming Gaslight District fits into this. While we don't know too much about the Gaslight District, the official synopsis says, The show takes place after the end of the world and centers around a group of undead gangsters that fight for control of what's left of it. This lines up perfectly with the Earth being destroyed at the end of Murder Drones. While the planet is destroyed, there are still giant chunks of land shown floating about, and the people on the island have been cursed by God himself to stay on one singular island. Not only would an island easily fit one of those chunks, God's influence perfectly explained why humans are still there even though they're all supposed to be dead. They even use religious imagery to fight the absolute solver in Murder Drones. And that is the Glitch Production Matrix Theory. Thank you very much.